Members of the diplomatic corps, distinguished guests from government, the private sector, international organizations, NGOs, and guests from the media, a warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for attending our webinar, Building Resilience Index, Mainstreaming Resilience in the Built Environment in the Philippines. I am Angelo Tan, Green Building Country Lead for the Philippines of the International Finance Corporation, a member of the World Bank Group, and I will be your moderator for today. Before we start, a few notes about our webinar. This web webinar is being recorded. Materials will be shared in a few hours once the system generates the recording. The recording will be posted on the EDGE YouTube channel. During the session, please use the Q&A feature to ask questions. You can submit questions at any point during the webinar. If we cannot get to all the questions during the session, we will send answers via email. At the end of the presentation, before we turn to questions, we'll send you a link to fill out our feedback survey, which helps us improve our delivery. To officially welcome everyone to the program, I'd like to introduce Mr. Vivek Patak, Director and Global Head of IFC's Climate Business. In this role, Vivek facilitates business growth, provides thought leadership, new product development, which now includes Building Resilience Index, and facilitates all work related to climate business. He is responsible for identifying new business opportunities for climate business and facilitating the mobilization of capital into this space. Many among us in the region know Vivek's impact because prior to his current appointment, Vivek was IFC's Regional Director for East Asia and the Pacific, leading advisory and investment operations across 18 countries, which in fiscal year 2020 reached $4.2 billion in long-term investments, including funds mobilized from other investors. Please welcome Mr. Vivek Patak. Well, uh, thank you very much, Angelo. A uh, very, very good morning to all of y'all and a uh, very good evening to my colleagues in DC. And thank you so much for doing this at a late hour. Uh, today holds special significance for me because it was many, many years ago that I remember talking to our then country manager of the Philippines, Jane Shu, that the uh, Philippines is a country where we want to pilot something new and something in the area of resilience. I, I honestly didn't know what exactly it will turn out to be. I knew the end result that we wanted, that Philippines is a country that is prone to a lot of natural disasters. And so therefore, as a multilateral development bank, what can we do to really pioneer something in this space? So I'm really, really delighted to see that uh, we are launching the BRI today in the Philippines. It's a first step. A lot more needs to be done. But like they say, every journey begins with a small step. So a big congratulations to the team, all of y'all on the ground and in Washington and other parts of the world who made this happen. Unfortunately, today, the scenario around the world is not a very pleasant one. Uh, between COVID and climate change, uh, developing countries are being hit very hard here. We at the bank group recognize that both climate change and the pandemic are acute threats to global, to global development and could undo decades of great work that have led to a number of people coming out of poverty. This could ultimately lead to instability, increased poverty, fragility, and migration. Uh, as we all know, according to the global, the global Climate Risk Index in 2021, uh, seven of the top countries most affected by extreme weather events from the period 2000 to 2019 are effectively low middle-income countries. The Philippines ranked four in that. What does that mean? It means that the situation is getting worse, that countries being impacted by natural disasters is increasing. In fact, the number of disaster events have almost doubled globally between 1980 to 1999. And this has a huge economic impact. If we overlay this with what's happening with the current pandemic, it makes the world's most vulnerable countries and the most vulnerable populations even more vulnerable. But I would also argue that there is a silver lining and with every crisis, there's an opportunity. So here we are presented with an opportunity to lay the groundwork for a green, resilient and inclusive recovery. During the 2021 spring meetings, the bank group highlighted that the COVID response for developing countries and climate action are central to what we're calling GRID, 
which is a green, resilient, inclusive development. So this is something that we hope will contribute towards creative. I also wanted to share with you all that we have announced our goals for Paris alignment, and we will be Paris aligned by 85% of our operations will be Paris aligned starting July 1, 2023, and 100% July 1, 2025. And we've also come up with a very ambitious target where we want to increase our climate financing to 35% of our total commitments on an average over the next five years. So what is the BRI or the Building Resilience Index? It's a novel tool which has the potential to become the new edge. Edge for IFC is a, an innovative product for green buildings, which we have socialized across developing countries. So the Building Resilience Index is an innovation which we have pioneered. It's a web-based hazard mapping and resilience assessment framework that evalu evaluates location-specific climate-related risks for real estate projects or real estate portfolios and the resilience measures that have been implemented. This is again critical if you look at our commitment towards Paris alignment. As we all know, this is an integral part of Paris alignment. So what does the BRI do? It will facilitate the identification, management, and disclosure of disaster risks in buildings, and it will be the first of its kind in the world. We're piloting this tool in the Philippines with 10 projects. Where do we go from here? We'd really like this to be the next edge for IFC. So we're developing the BRI app. We're partnering with a number of stakeholders, which includes financial institutions, development uh, developers, policymakers, and academia. We would like to scale this up through strategic partnerships, through marketing and business development. And finally, we'd like to have a global launch of this. This will really open new business opportunities, and we hope mobilize capital towards a more resilient society. Investors in credit rating agencies are looking far more closely at how companies align themselves with low carbon resilient growth. Similarly, climate action is an investment opportunity for the private sector. Climate change is climate business, and this is really a priority for IFC. ERI and rating the resilience of buildings will complement other tools that are already being used for financial institutions, such as EDGE for the development of green buildings and the CAFE tool for assessing climate eligibility for investments. Finally, a big thanks to our sponsors, our donors, without whom this would not have happened. I would like to thank the Kingdom of the Netherlands, represented at this event by Her Excellency, by Her Excellency Saskia de Lang, Ambassador of the Netherlands to the Philippines, and the Australian government, represented at this event by James Yeomans, Acting Deputy Head of Mission at the Australian Embassy in the Philippines, who's representing His Excellency Stephen J. Robinson, Australian Ambassador to the Philippines. I would also like to thank our partners in the Philippines, ARISE, the Private Sector Alliance for Disaster Resilient Society, which is represented at this event by Vice Admiral Alexander Pama, who is the co-chair of ARISE Philippines. So with that, again, a very warm welcome to all of you all and a personal thanks for making this happen. The whole concept started when I was regional director, and I'm really happy to see that it's culminated with my heading the Climate Business Group at the IFC. I wish you all a very successful event and launch, and even more success as we're able to hopefully globalize this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vivek. As mentioned by Vivek, the Netherlands played a very important role for our work in Building Resilience Index. Through the generosity of the Dutch government, IFC was awarded a seed funding, without which we could not have started working on this tool. We hope to continue this partnership onward as we develop and scale up the use of BRI. Representing the Netherlands today, Ambassador Saskia de Lang is Ambassador of the Netherlands in the Philippines since 2019. Co-accredited to the Republic of Palau, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and the Federated States of Micronesia. In her previous position in Congo, Brazzaville, she represented the European Union as Ambassador and Head of Delegation. Aside from various assignments leading diplomatic missions to Uganda, Mali, Tunisia, Qatar, Rwanda, Luxembourg, and other countries, the ambassador also served as special envoy for energy and energy security, representing the Netherlands in bilateral and multilateral energy talks. It is my honor to introduce Her Excellency Saskia de Lang, Ambassador of the Netherlands to the Philippines. Madam Ambassador. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tan, and uh, thank you for having me here in this, uh, in this event, uh, which is very timely. 
And um, I, on behalf of the government of, uh, of the Netherlands, I would like to welcome, welcome you all to this event. This uh, morning's discussion focuses on uh, a risk assessment called the Building Resilience Index, and it has been developed by the IFC with the support of my government. A third of my country is below sea level, and therefore we have a very deep ingrained awareness of the risks from seas, storms and floods and climate change. Improving our resilience is at the core of our spatial planning and of building regulations. And this is also true for the six Caribbean islands that are part of the Kingdom of the Netherlands and that are very prone to extreme trop tropical weather conditions. The Philippines is uh, one of the most vulnerable countries in the world to natural disasters. Um, over 74% of its population is considered at risk for to hazards, including flooding, typhoons, landslides, earthquakes, tsunami, volcanic er eruptions. And those 74% uh, includes also participants to this, this webinar who are posted or working and living here in the Philippines. So in order to meet this uh, immense challenge, cities need to build urban resilience, which means that they need to improve a city's capacity to survive and to adapt and to grow despite the chronic and acute risk and shock. The resilience index is about creating incentives for resilient building. And decision makers in government will need it to set standards for, for example, in the building code. And financial institutions will need it as a, as a tool that will help them develop financial products favoring resilient building. And insurance companies will also love it since it will help them to better understand and assess risks and, uh, and will allow them to adapt their products accordingly. Talking about helping to build resilience. As a partner of the Philippines, the Netherlands has supported the creation of the Manila Bay Sustainable Development Master Plan. With unaltered policies, this metropolis is subsiding annually by approximately eight centimeters. And the master plan is a tool for managing water and groundwater levels, wastewater, and waste and the marine ecosystems in the bay. It is a tool for deciding on future infrastructure, and it is a tool to counter many of those uh, uh, worrying developments. And NEDA, the National Economic Development Agency of the Philippines, has the lead on this uh, major project. On the island of Leite, the Dutch uh, have been supporting the municipalities of Tacloban and Palo in developing coastal protection plans following typhoons. And as we speak, a scoping mission of Dutch and Filipino experts are identifying urgent coastal protection measures in Catanduanes, that's the island that was very badly affected by the last typhoon season. More broadly, our embassy in Manila supports initiatives to create more climate resilient cities in line with the SDG 11, that is sustainable cities and communities. And here in the Philippines, we have introduced solutions for cycling and sustainable transport, for waste management and for urban agriculture. Back to the resilient, uh, back to the build, building resilience index. I see this initiative as a tool to bring together engineers and policymakers, financiers and consumers to make informed decisions in building, financing and, in, and investing. And we from the Netherlands are very proud in supporting this initiative. It underscores our own efforts to build climate and disaster resilience in the Philippines. And we hope that the tool will allow to improve the quality of decision making and ultimately the quality of life of millions of people in the cities of the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Madam Ambassador, and we hope to continue partnering with the Dutch government. The pilot work for Building Resilience Index in the Philippines will play a very crucial role to inform how we develop BRI and scale up its adoption globally. 
We are grateful to the support of the Australian government to continue this pioneering work in the Philippines, which could also benefit other countries who in the future will use this tool. We are honored to be joined today by Mr. James Yeomans, Acting Deputy Head of Mission of the Australian Embassy in the Philippines. James Yeomans took up his appointment at the Australian Embassy in the Philippines in September 2020. Mr. Yeomans is a lawyer by background and joined the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, or DFAT, in 2004. He has held a number of positions, including most recently, Director of Services Negotiations in the Regional Trade Agreements Division. He has held various roles in diplomatic missions in Peru, Brunei, Mexico, Chile, and performed roles in DFAT's international organizations and international legal divisions in Canberra. To deliver welcome remarks for the Australian government, Mr. James Yeomans. Thank you, Angelo, and, and good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here on behalf of the Australian Embassy in the Philippines at today's launch. I'd also like to thank especially the organizer for this event, the IFC uh, of the World Bank Group, who, of course, is our implementing partner for this project. One thing I'd like to talk about is sort of, you know, why this project is important for Australia. And I suppose to begin with, it's important to recognise that Australia and the Philippines have a very long standing relationship. In fact, this year is our 75th anniversary of diplomatic relations, and we have been a long standing friend to the Philippines. Part of that friendship involves supporting inclusive economic development. And this is really an important feature of our development assistance to the Philippines. We support a sovereign, stable, and resilient Philippines that can return quickly to economic growth, especially now after the challenges of COVID-19. And the way we do this is by working with established and trusted partners, such as the IFC, to help the Philippines strengthen its own systems and capabilities. Now, Australia believes that a solid and ethical private sector is really crucial to sustainable economic development. And that is, of course, necessary to boost jobs, incomes, to reduce poverty, and to really help developing countries make progress on the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So all our development work is closely aligned to the work of the private sector, but especially in the area of climate change. As we all know, and as we've heard, uh, the Philippines uh, is very vulnerable to climate change. There are a number of countries in the region, including Australia, where this is an important challenge. So it is really important that we work to address uh, issues of climate change for both the social and economic well-being of the country. Australia has pledged over the last or a period of five years, 1.5 billion Australian dollars for global climate finance to help our partners address climate change, improve disaster resilience, and also to focus on renewable energy. Now in the Philippines, part of these funds go towards the eight, one point, sorry, 18 million Australian dollar project called SHIELD, which is a five year program we're working on with the UNDP. And SHIELD is implemented in the most vulnerable areas of the Philippines to really help make people and communities safer and more resilient to the impacts of climate change. Its main objective is to strengthen the frameworks for building resilience at the national level, including through policy reforms, uh, such as updating, building and construction standards. Now, of course, in addition to SHIELD, another one of our key programs is Australia's private sector development program, which we work on with the IFC. And part of that, the reason why we're all here today, is the Building Resilience Project, or, or BRI. And as we know, the BRI focuses primarily on climate resilience. And investing in resilience has a number of impacts, a number of important benefits. It not only saves lives, but of course it makes good economic sense. Bringing back to the point I made before about the importance of working with the private sector to address issues such as climate change because of the economic impact. And, it, and the thing about the BRI is that it's an innovative tool which we, we really think has the potential to mainstream resilience into the design, construction, and maintenance of a whole range of buildings. And if used uh, in partnership with the private sector, with the government, and with other stakeholders, 
we really do believe it will build resilience across the country. And furthermore, as a, as a pilot project for the region, and this is what we heard earlier, that this project has the potential to be rolled out across other countries. So it has an immediate impact here in the Philippines, but a much bigger potential as well. So without anything further, we're gonna look forward to today's discussion. Uh, thank you to all our partners in the IFC and Australia will remain committed to working with the Philippines on addressing challenges such as climate resilience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. James Yeomans, and we hope to continue this relationship. We are grateful for ARISE, the Private Sector Alliance for Disaster Resilient Societies and its Philippine chapter, who has agreed to become our local partner in scaling up private sector adoption of higher resilience practices and transparency through BRI disclosure. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Vice Admiral Alexander Patino Pama is a retired Vice Admiral of the Armed Forces of the Philippines. He was appointed Flag Officer in Command of the Philippine Navy in 2011 and served as such until his retirement from military service in December 2012. He is currently the co-chair of the Board of Directors of Arise Philippines, a private sector alliance supporting the UNDRR advocacy of achieving the goals of the Sendai Framework for Action. USEC Alex Pama is likewise a consultant to the National Resilience Council, a science and technology-based public-private partnership that supports government, communities, the academe, and private sector in advancing the attainment of disaster resilience. Concurrently, he is also the consultant for disaster resilience of SM Prime Holdings, among his many other involvements. To officially open the program and deliver a message from Arise, please welcome Vice Admiral Alexander Pama. Yusek. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me, Angelo? <clears throat> yes, yes, Yusek. Okay. Thank you very much, Angelo, uh, for that very, very uh, generous introduction. Anyway, good morning and good evening to everyone. Allow me first to greet uh, Director Patat, Ambassador DeLang, Mr. James Humans the organizers and attendees of this forum, and our fellow, fellow stakeholders of the resilient, for a resilient Philippines. It is indeed a pleasure and a privilege for me to be with you today, as we all undertake what to us is a very important undertaking that can serve as a vanguard in our collective efforts towards more resilient communities and societies, particularly in the context of buildings and other infrastructures. This is especially crucial in countries such as ours, where we do have a burgeoning construction industry in spite of the setbacks by this pandemic. We cannot and should not slow down. However, this time around, we need to institute better and more resilient processes and systems. Thus, this Building Resilience Index pilot project we are undertaking is an idea whose time has come. To contextualize, allow me to cite our situation here in the Philippines and cite why BRI is indeed a welcome development for the Philippines and consequently the region and the world. In 2020, we, there were a total of 31,026 construction projects in the country valued at around 60, 63 billion pesos or around 1.5 billion US dollars of this, 4,670, or approximately 18%, were new non-residential constructions that include building projects for commercial, industrial, and institutional purposes. In the National Capital Region, or the National Capital Region NCR accounts for 21.6% of the total value of construction projects at 13.6 billion pesos, followed by Calabarzon Region at 11.6 billion pesos. And these are, mind you, ladies and gentlemen, along what we call the, the, Met, the West Valley Fault Line. These figures are from the Philippine Statistics Authority. And while these numbers are lower versus previous years for obvious reasons, they, will, they still represent a substantial amount of investment that are at risk given the host of natural disasters that impact the Philippines annually. If we are to build a truly resilient country, we need to make sure that our investments are properly, properly protected from these disaster risks. This is why 
I am very excited about the Building Resilience Index Initiative that is at the forefront and center of our forum today. And I would like to commend the International Finance Corporation, the World Bank, and the sponsors, donors, the US, uh, I'm sorry, the Australian and the Netherlands government for leading this essential and critical step at mainstreaming resilience in the built environments of the Philippines. We at Arise Philippines, the local network for the Global Private Sector Alliance for Disaster Resilient Societies organized by the UNDRR, fully embrace the, BR, the BRI as a tool for building our resilience. On one hand, the BRI incentivizes building owners and developers to incorporate risk mitigation measures in their plans. On the other hand, as a tool for driving risk-informed investment decisions, the BRI provides financiers with a means of evaluating building project investments, so as, as a means to well-informed decisions for their investments. As it is, the BRI touches on three arises Philippine priority areas, and these are investors and investments, insurance and reinsurance, and resilient infrastructures. The success of this initiative will truly make a big impact in our efforts to build the culture of resilience, especially in the private sector. That is why we at Arise Philippines are more than happy and excited to promote this tool among our current and future members. Our wish is for this initiative is for BRI to catalyze a change in mindset among project owners and development developers for them to appreciate the incorporating that incorporating resilience in their infrastructure plans is more than just a nice thing to do. Rather, it is indeed a wise investment and a well-informed decision. It is a strategic and positive investment move when viewed in the context of the growing threats of climate change and other geologic hazards that are ever present in our country. Our, we, um, the BAR is a step in the right direction as much as this tool allows us to co-own the challenge reducing our disaster risks. For today, I am confident that our speakers will provide us with a deeper understanding and a more appreciation about the project. And in line with this, therefore, we in Arise Philippines shall exert efforts to push the envelope to pursue the advocacy among our relevant members, as well as other project owners and developers and financiers to be with us in this project. Now is the perfect time, as a lot of indicators have shown that owners and developers have become more perceptive and receptive towards more use of sciences and implementation of technologies and strategies to enhance their project's resilience against natural hazards. And in the Philippines, we have more than enough of such hazards. We hope by the end of this forum, all of us shall, have been, shall be one with a strengthened resolve to push this initiative forward. Thank you very much and be safe and well, all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, USEC Alex. And we hope that through the IFC and Arise partnership, we can scale up the use of BRI in the Philippines. I'm sure many of you are curious to learn about Building Resilience Index. I would like to introduce Omid Saberi, Senior, Senior Industry Specialist at the International Finance Corporation. Omid Saberi is the global lead of the Building Resilience Index program. Omid works across projects within the World Bank Group, including IFC investment and advisory projects, and has done extensive work with the property sector, as well as funds and commercial bank clients to divert investments to climate smart and resilient projects. Before joining IFC, Omid advised on sustainability strategies for property development projects in the UK the Middle East and Asia, including development of green building codes for various countries. Omid has also been a member of regional government advisory panels as an expert in low energy design and technical director for energy conservation at the city scale. Please welcome to introduce Building Resilience Index, Omid Saberi. Thank you so much, Angelo. And I'm honored to be here. This is, this is like dream come true after after the work that we have been doing on um, on resilience. Uh, uh, Michelle, can you please continue presentation from your side if you don't mind?
Uh, so very pleased to be here and I would like to uh, take you through what building resilience is about and what we have done so far and what are our plans for future. So if you go please to the uh, slide on World Bank Action Plan. The next slide, please. So the, the story of the climate resilience is very important to World Bank Group as uh, we heard from Vivek as well in terms of the work that we are doing across the World Bank Group and within IFC. And the guiding principle within the World Bank Group is one of the action plans that has been um, done in 2019. In 2019, World Bank Group issued, a, uh, issued an action plan on climate change adaptation and resilience, um, named, ma namely managing risks for more resilient future. Within the action plan, there are three areas of focus, which I, I want to take your attention to. Number one is that we want to make sure that our two funds for low income and middle income countries, IDA and IBRD, will boost direct adaptation finance to $50 billion over the fiscal year of 21 to 25. This is almost double the achievement during um, F fiscal year 15 to 18. And this puts adaptation finance within the World Bank Group on par with our investment in climate change mitigation. These are two important um, targets within World Bank Group. The second is that we want to support countries to take mainstream approach to adaptation so that climate risks are managed at every phase of policy planning, investment design, and implementation. And the third, which is important, is uh, we will develop new rating system to incentivize investments in adaptation and resilience and improve tracking. Building resilience index responds to the third item here, trying to come up with a solution for the uh, building and real estate sector. This is a sector that is very important, as, as we know, most of our cities built by, by buildings. Um, and it's a very important sector that, um, you know, connects communities, people with uh, construction sector and with disasters. And that's very important connection that we need to um, make sure that this segment has been, um, has been uh, built with uh, properly. But what, are, what we have done in our track record so far, we have developed um, EDGE program. EDGE program is a program that has been developed for climate mitigation in building sector, and uh, that program has been very successful globally. So far, EDGE has been implemented in 53 countries and has been expanding globally as becoming a, a standard for green buildings in, in many countries. On resilience, we couldn't really mix these two programs together. That's why we came up with a solution called Building Resilience Index as a sister to EDGE. We, we want to keep it as a separate program, and we'll explain why this is a separate program, but we want to learn from the success of EDGE program and implement Building Resilience. We have heard about you know, how the, the world is changing. Uh, given the COVID conditions, now more than ever, countries need resilience. We know that countries are under extreme pressure from economic point of view, from jobs point of view, and climate uh, disasters or natural disasters can become a, a, even harder problem to, uh, for these countries to to deal with. This table shows disasters since 1970. If you look at the dark blue and light blue, the dark blue is the flood events, and light blue is all the extreme uh, weather events since 1970. And as you see, these, these trends are increasing. As we heard from the ambassador of Netherlands, we are seeing that these trends are not only impacting Philippines, but other regions and an entire planet. What has been, if you look at the number of events happening um, on those two extreme weather events, they are almost started from uh, the flood events was around 30 and now it's more than 100 events per year. So the, the number of events are increasing and obviously the cost of these events are increasing. So the cost of damage is extremely high. 
uh, as you see in these examples, again, this is showing the cost of disasters in US billions since 1970. And each of those lines shows one of the one of the events. Uh, the light green shows insured losses and, and orange color shows uninsured losses since 1970 due to natural disasters. As you see, these numbers are for, for Philippines and only two events, and um, Haiyang event in 2013 and in 2014, Glenda. Together, they cost the economy of the Philippines almost 14, um, sorry, 140 billion pesos in these, these two, uh, two events only. So these events, obviously, not everything can be covered by insurance. But the point is that um, how can we do and make our buildings in a sense that we can reduce the cost of these disasters? We will come back later in the expert panel to ask what is the difference between the code and building resilience and why building resilience can go beyond the code to protect the assets. So what is building resilience index? The building resilience index has three elements and looking at these elements purely through a building developer point of view. When you want to build a building, the first question you want to ask is what are the disasters or natural hazards in my location? A lot of times answering that question is not that easy. We have been speaking to developers in Philippines. We have met with um, lots of agencies. There are already some tools in the market, but still those tools need to be improved for building sector to take the full advantage of. The second piece is that now I know what are those risks. For example, I know that the wind speed is 220, maximum wind speed is 220 kilometers per hour, or the flood um, level is one meter depth. What can I do if, if I want to build a residential project or a commercial project, what can I do to protect myself against those disasters? That comes under the managing risk. And that's where we want to make sure that there are clear guidance to the builders that they know what exactly they have to do and how are we going to measure each of those actions to mitigate those risks. And finally, how can I disclose my risk? so that the banker, the buyer, the insurance company, everyone can understand exactly what I'm doing and how I'm protecting my building against these, these risks. If we look at the, uh, the current mapping functions, uh, one of the uh, very, very uh, well-prepared websites in Philippines that is one of the best in the world is the Hazard Hunter Philippines. Hazard Hunter Philippines has been developed in Philippines and it uh, can show you for specific points what are the ha different hazard um, conditions. However, if you look at the data from a construction builder point of view, there are still some gaps in this data that we need to work on together with uh, partners from Philippines to make sure this data can be tailored to construction sector. So there is still need, uh, work needed to be done on mapping functions. And as I said, Philippines is one of the best countries when we go to uh, Pacific Islands or we go to Caribbean, this data is even, even in that uh, level is not available. So resilience, building resilience will be supporting on the mapping function as one of the key areas of, of work. The second part would be to understand what is the uh, elements we are going to deal with? Uh, to simplify the process, because in EDGE we learned that if the system is complex, nobody will do it. We try to simplify the, the system. Therefore, we will be having these four elements, wind, water, geoseismic, and fire. These four elements to protect the building against these four, four elements. Obviously, these elements come from different sources, but what, we, what matters for us is to make sure that these, uh, the buildings are resilient to these four elements. And to, to test them, we need to go through a physical integrity review. And the physical integrity review will show whether our building is um, resilient to each of these elements and what is the level of resilience for each of these elements in buildings. 
Once we've gone through the physical integrity review, the second level would be operational continuity. We figure out if my building stands this situation, whether my building can continue to operate or there's, there's issues that my building cannot simply operate after the disaster. So those are the two, two checks that we will go through during the building resilience index review. So mitigation measures. Uh, mitigation measures are very important. Obviously, as an engineer, uh, engineers need to know exactly what they are supposed to do or what, what level they need to design something. If we are going very qualitative or you know, very generic, they wouldn't be able to know what to do. So that's why uh, developing mitigation measures with global experts and Philippines experts is critical for us to come up with exact language and solution for every single element to figure out the, the page here you see is a page of the user guide. We prepared the user guide and we'll continue to develop the user guide to understand what are the mitigation measures, uh, what can I do for every single element and how I can cost these uh, mitigation measures. So building resilience index has five levels and these five levels are in line with World Bank defined five levels of resilience for different sectors. And this is very exciting because this, imagine one day in Philippines, maybe 10 years down the line, we can come back and see every single building has a resilience rating. So the building that you are sitting in, when you come to the lobby, you see that your building is rated C, B, A, or R. If your building is rated R, you know that there are, there are risks in your building. If your building is rated C, it means that it is getting the minimum requirements from the local conditions to meet the resilience conditions. If your building is B rated, it means that you're meeting the best practices that locally and exist within Philippines. If your building is rated A, it means that your building is uh, meeting the best practices globally. So your building is doing the best that one can do globally to protect against wind or to protect against flood or just seismic or, or other elements. We will discuss this further in the, in the panel discussion. And if your building is A+, plus, it means that not only meets the best practices globally, but also it has operational continuity elements. There is another element here which I take your, your attention to, and it's probable maximum loss. So the maximum loss due to a hazard event can, can increase when you go from A to B, from average 10% to 20%, and from B to C, from 20% to 40%. And when you go to C to R, the maximum loss can be more than 50% of the building value. So that kind of shows how this translates to cost of loss in, in buildings. So how, the, the principle of weakest link, um, BRI will be based on principle of weakest link. What it means, it means that if my building is rated R level for fire, C level for geoseismic, A for water and B for wind, my rating would be R, which is the mi minimum level of condition that I am I'm meeting. What this will ensure, this will ensure that developers, they would try to push all the levels to C or, or higher. Therefore, they, they will raise the bar of buildings. And what also it, this means, this means that, you know, resilience is not a you know, the, the modern nature will test us against the minimum, the weakest link. So whatever is our weakest link, that's where the, the risk is. And we need to solve that, that piece before trying to raise the other pieces higher. A building, when it meets A level for all the um, four hazard conditions, then that, then that building can be rated A. And if that building meets the operational continuity measures, can be A plus. We would ask what are the operational continuity measures? For example, a building can be a green certified building, which has solar panels and it has tanks for water in case of water cut of the city so that the building can continue operation, operating. 
that building becomes A plus. Maybe hospitals need to be A plus, maybe schools need to be A plus, or maybe our um, sensitive assets needs to be A plus to make sure that they can continue despite the city being under, under pressure because of the disaster. So, as we know, our first project is in the Philippines, and we are very pleased. And my heart is very close to Philippines. We, I, I have been part of the consultancy work with the IFC to develop the green building code in Philippines. Um, the, the next region for us is Caribbean islands. We want to continue this work in Caribbean islands and on, on resilience, and then obviously uh, Pacific islands. Those are the three regions that uh, we are going to start with, but the goal is that this program becomes a global program and it will have access to the entire planet. What are the benefits? Um, everyone would win by investing in resilience, and this is very important for us, mainly for financial institutions, and that's why we have BPI here today to talk about the angle of financial institutions and benefit of financial resilience for financial institutions. We know that governments will win with less costs. We know that construction developers, um, they will win because they will differentiate themselves by showing, showcasing their, their technologies and their um, skills and resilience. And we have two, um, two of the best and large uh, commercial developers in Philippines today as well to talk about their experience with resilience. Obviously, property owners and occupants will win as well by resilience. What is what matters here is is the cost of cost benefit to resilience, and this is a study by the by the National Institute of Building Science in in the U United States where. It shows, for example, investing $1 in wind resilience can save $10 in damages due to wind. So every $1 invested in resilience can benefit the owner or country or project $10. So that's also, you, know, you, you can see the numbers for, for all, all types of uh, resilience elements. So lastly, I want to, to share this slide to, to say what IFC is trying to do. IFC is trying to bring, obviously, with our own direct investments, when we do investments in any building sector, we like to encourage those sectors to move to more resilience and green conditions. The second is we like to continue collaborating with banks and local commercial banks to, to work on financing products like resilience bonds to increase the investment in resilient buildings. We also work on resilience building codes and incentives. We like to ensure that governments appreciate more resilient buildings and provide incentives to those, those buildings. And finally, with development of the building resilience application to enable all these elements of the market to connect to each other and collaborate with each other. Thank you so much and back to you, Angela. Thank you so much, Ahmed. As we continue to unpack the business case and the technical case for Building Resilience Index, a reminder that we have a Q&A feature on WebEx. Feel free to type in your questions so we can address them. From that last um, slide that Ahmed showed us, we know that we need to work across the ecosystem to really scale up resilience in the built environment in the Philippines. The financial sector will play a very crucial role in this effort. Ms. Joan Bueno Ayala is a vice president and the new head of BPI Sustainability Office, which covers all the ESG initiatives of BPI as well as its subsidiaries. Prior to this role, Ms. Ayala headed BPI Sustainable Development Finance or SDF program, which ensures BPI's loans for energy efficiency, renewable energy, climate resilience, green buildings, and sustainable agriculture are compliant to global standards and support the UN Sustainable Development Goals. As of end 2020, BPI SDF's portfolio has dispersed almost 200 billion pesos to finance more than 350 small to mid-sized projects. This milestone helped establish BPI as the country's leading bank in sustainability today, with the SDF receiving various local and international recognition. 
To talk about the financial sector's role in improving the resilience of our buildings from BPI, I would like to welcome Ms. Joanne Ayala. Thank you, Angelo. Um, yes, may I please be allowed to share? Okay. Um, All right, uh, you're the presenter now, Joanne. All right. Okay, so is that showing? Yes, it is, thank you. All right. So good morning, everyone, and uh, congratulations, IFC, and congratulations to the BI, BRI team. Um, I am uh, asked, I've been asked to talk about what we do in BPI under the Sustainable, Sustainable Development Finance Program of the bank. And I was assigned to talk about the role of banks in scaling resilience in the built environment. Now, um, this we always say as, as a start, why, why do sustainability, you're a bank, um, why do you need to be part of, of this campaign? Well, of course, we all know that um, global warming is happening, 3.3 millimeters of increase in seawater per year. That is a serious matter. But if you look at the Philippines case, we're even in a worse situation because um, in fact, we're not only exposed to a lot of climate hazards, we, are, we also have um, other environmental hazards which are beyond climate, and that includes um, earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Um, and this is because we are in the Pacific Ring of Fire. So we uh, have fault lines crisscrossing the whole country. So um, the threat uh, to destruction to both low rise and high rise buildings is, is just there. Fortunately, sustainability has become a priority, um, even to the business sector. So ESG goals have moved to the core of business strategy and to the mainstream of um, investor attention. Sustainability has become an existential need, redefining our long-term goals. Um, in fact, our uh, president who just um, uh, retired as president of BPF two weeks ago said, don't let a good crisis go to waste. Um, and he would always remind me that um, ESG has uh, helped us reshape and reinvent our business models. And now we are very, very conscious of this um, need to climate proof our businesses and identify new opportunities along the way. And fortunately, the Philippine regulation, regulations have become even more conducive for ESG initiatives. Now, this is a long journey, but you can see from the first one, 2008, I, I must say that I do owe IFC a lot. They were my uh, first advisors. They were the advisors of BPI since 2008 when the Sustainable Energy Finance Program was launched. And um, they continue to influence us a lot, especially because uh, we continue to follow the standards that IFC espouses. And to date, as, um, IFC brings to the market, brings to the forefront of the built environment, the BRI, uh, our eyes are wide open, I'm waiting for this to completely unfold. And you will see later how uh, I'm making do in the meantime, that BRI is not yet fully useful for, for me, at least uh, I haven't fully implemented yet. But just to complete the, this journey, uh, just last Friday, BI, uh, BPI has already signed up as a supporter of PCFD. So the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures um, is already officially supported by the bank. So it just shows you how committed we are to doing sustainability. So the main program of the bank is called Sustainable Development Finance Program. And uh, this is because we recognize the importance of creating value for not only ourselves, but for our stakeholders, the businesses, the environment, and the communities where we operate. We definitely have sustainability in our DNA. It's in, our, in the core of our corporate strategy. Uh, and we are consistently promoting um, sustainability in businesses in various industries, um, in, in, even uh, in tie ups with the government in various sectors. And um, to date, what we are focusing on are 12 SDGs. Um, and we're, we're quite, quite happy about it. We'll increase it a little bit more, but at the moment, we're, doing, we're quite active in 12. There are four types of um, sustainable development projects under BPI, and the first two were the original ones that IFC have helped me um, in the back you know, put together. That's EE, Energy Efficiency and Renewables, 
um, in 2014, um, we started going into climate resilience, um, which included green buildings. And then last 2019, we started including sustainable agriculture. For purposes of our discussion today, we are focusing on the, our green building initiatives. And um, as part of that, as, as you can see, this is how we do it. Um, how, how does a BPI do it in, in the Philippine market under sustainable development finance? We do um, quite a number of um, education, um, educational sessions for clients. We give free technical advice thanks to the technical advisors that um, IFC has trained and accredited and we continue to use them today. I was just talking to one of them uh, last night, our green building advisor, um, just last night. Uh, and then that forms part. Now, the output of these um, technical assessment forms part of our risk assessment and continuous monitoring. Um, I'll describe later how we do our risk assessment now because we have included um, climate uh, and environmental hazards in our assessment of the building, of, of the plant structures. And those are all part of the putting together of the loan or the bonds that um, BPI is helping a client do. Of course, there are also guarantees on the side, and there was a time as well that IFC was our partner in providing guarantees, especially to SMEs. So, um, as mentioned, there are free technical consultations that are being done, um, and this is, again, with the help of IFC. The boxes on the left are represented by the parties that are um, the technical consultants trained and accredited by IFC and the boxes on the right are internal to BPI, the agri and the technical team. So you can see at the, bot at the bottom left that the green buildings are there. So um, we signed up with the PGBI, the Philippine Green Building Initiative. Actually, we're working with them since 2016, but the formal uh, partnership was signed in early 2018. And uh, to date, um, what has happened to the BPI Sustainable Development Finance Program is that we've done 158 EE, 89 RE, and 107 climate resilience projects where green buildings are also part of. Um, and that would be, as I would always tell our clients, not in CO2 terms, because they wouldn't understand what CO2 is. I would say um, describe it in terms of trees, so around 472 million trees converted. Um, of the 107 climate resilience projects, there are 45 green building projects valued at 24.7 billion pesos cumulative since December 2020. Well, as of December 2020. Um, the two later ones are the Savia Financial Center, uh, which is now um, registered as Edge Advance, and the 38 um, Park View in Cebu, which is an ongoing application for edge certification. There are a couple of more down the line and hopefully they will soon get their certification. So um, in the Philippines, there are, we are cautious of this. There are six building requirements following the green building code um, signing in 2016. So if a building is uh, at least 10,000 square meters, well, for a mall it's 15 and for residential it's 20,000. So very conscious of these of this um, regulatory requirement. In a way, in fact, this made it easier for us to convince clients to be very conscious about um, the, the requirements, the criteria for being green. Just because you use LED lights or inverter air cons doesn't make you qualified as a green building right away. So there's a lot of education that, that we needed to do. But the thing is we, as a bank, um, we're always, we always want to be quantitative in measuring um, compliance, in measuring criteria for, for evaluation. And that is where um, EDGE came in. Because what we like about EDGE a lot is that the measurement for savings is very specific. 20% in energy efficiency, 20% in water, and 20% in embodied materials. So this made us, um, at, at the onset, uh, it, as early as uh, 2013, 2014, there were already uh, projects that were subjected to edge to the edge criteria for evaluation and that we like a lot. Now, um, for our environmental and climate hazard management, we have started doing this as early as 2011 to 2014, conscious of the fact that we are indeed one of the most vulnerable countries in the world. So, um, 
the thing is, we, we need something more because we could only do, what, four cities at the time. Fortunately, uh, by, by last year, by December last year, we were able to map 1,647 cities and municipalities already. And this is for earthquakes, typhoons, and flooding. And the tool that we use there is what Omid mentioned earlier, Hazard Hunter, which was done by, um, by government, Revolks and uh, Pagasa, funded by the DOST. And uh, the, the idea is uh, for us to be able to identify hazards, uh, as I said, flooding, earthquakes, and uh, volcanic eruption, we, we needed to identify pinpointed per location. Um, what the hazards are. And so BPI was able to determine our exposure, the client's exposure to these natural hazards. So um, at the end of the day, uh, the question is, um, uh, just, just to complete that, um, the, the thing is because of this tool, um, we are able to identify the risk and therefore determine and uh, tell the clients, uh, please see the results. This is not done by BPI, but done by our um, no less than our PVOX and DOST and PAGASA teams, scientists in government. So you may want to do some engineering intervention or ensure um, your uh, respective assets. But it stops there. We, we do not have direct, um, a direct tool for managing uh, the, the, the hazard for specifically uh, identifying the solution or measuring whether the solution matches the hazard and at the end of the game disclosing in as much as we plan to with PCFT, for instance. So there are no there there, there is indeed a gap there. So um anyway, um so um in the end, what, what do we do? Uh what we want to tell clients is this we, we do environmental, we do social, we do governance um initiatives, but at the end of the day, um one thing about environmental um, initiatives is that we need to be aware of the environmental risk, but we also need to be, so that is our, um, environmental should be seen in two ways. One is how is our impact to the environment, our greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera, in waste management. But at the end of the day, we need to know the risks that the environment is posing on us. And then we also have our own social initiatives not only to help employment, but to boost economic growth, especially in the local front. And then of course, as a bank, we have our own um, governance um, initiatives. But at the end of the day, there has to be also this economic uh, impact whereby uh, our initiatives result to profitability. And profitability is, goes hand in hand with um, risk management. Because there could be substantial losses emanating from uh, being remiss or not being able to identify certain risks, being able to mitigate them you know, and making sure that you are resilient enough. So um, that is what we add to, to the ESG formula. So ours uh, would have been ESG plus E. And uh, again, thanks to IFC, that is not unique to me. That's among the things that IFC has also helped me um, put together. So the winning formula for the private sector, as we always say, is that you, you have to have compliance, you have to be contributing to the, to the community and providing employment. There has to be climate resilience built into your, your project. You have to be innovative and there has to be some level of minimum operational efficiency for you to achieve profitability, which at the end put together is shared value. But this profitability is, um, not just plain profitability, it has to have its own purpose. It has to have its impact on the environment and, and the social fronts. And um, in the end, it leads to sustainability. So that is our mantra. Uh, I would always say this, and sometimes people will get shocked and say, uh, well, it's not sufficient that you're green. You have to make gold, you have to make profit out of your sustainability initiative for it to be sustained, for it to be continuing until the next generations. That's it. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Joanne. Don't let a good crisis go to waste and don't be left behind. Very good messages to leave our audience. Thank you. Our next two speakers are two of the staunchest advocates of sustainable and resilient development in the Philippines. 
Ms. Lisa Celerio is currently the Vice President for Corporate Compliance Group for SM Prime Holdings with 20 years of experience in mall operations. Um, apologies, let me just switch. I yeah. just need to share, yeah. One moment. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Ms. Lisa Celerio is currently the Vice President for Corporate Compliance Group for SM Prime Holdings with 20 years of experience in mall operations. Concurrently, Ms. Celerio is also the Program Director for SM Environment and Sustainability, as well as a global board member for the Arise Private Sector Alliance for Disaster Resilient Societies. She is also Chairperson of Artigas Center Association, and the association is a non-stock, non-profit organization commissioned to uphold the stature of our Ortiga Center as one of the nation's prime business districts. Ms. Lisa Silerio is a registered civil engineer. Our other speaker is Mr. Raymond Rufino, who is currently the CEO of NEO, the only office developer with its entire portfolio certified five stars under the National Voluntary Green Building Rating Tool of the Philippines, VERDE, making it one of the foremost green office developers in the country. Mr. Rufino also holds various leadership positions in Urban Land Institute, Philippine Green Building Council, WWF Philippines, and Rice Philippines. Mr. Rufino is a licensed real estate broker and graduated with a Master of Science in Real Estate Development from Columbia University and a Bachelor of Science in Management from the Ateneo de Manila University. To share developer perspectives and engage in a dialogue on building resilience index between developers, please welcome Lisa Celerio and Raymond Rufino. So let me just switch uh, to Ms. Um, Lisa first for her presentation. Okay. So uh, good morning and good evening to everyone. Slides, please. Oh, I think Michelle, you can just navigate. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I represent SM Prime Holdings, one of the largest integrated property developers in Southeast Asia that offers innovative and sustainable lifestyle cities with the development of malls, residences, hotels, offices, and convention centers, among other businesses. Slide, please. Can, okay, this is it. Concurrently, uh, next slide. Concurrently, I serve as chair person of the Ortigas Center Association, Inc., or OCAI, a non stock a nonprofit organization that is commissioned to oversee the administration of Ortigas Center one of the prime commercial business districts in Metro Manila. Okay has 140 member buildings and has jurisdiction over 108 hectares of land that cross over three major cities, Pasig, Mandaluyong, and Quezon City. And as a property developer, it is imperative that our structures are securely built from ground up to withstand exposure to the elements and weather phenomenon common to our region. And as an administrator to a business district, we pay attention to developers and building owners construction and ensure that minimum requirements of the national building code are met. We recognize that resilience contributes to a sound business strategy, taking into account future risk, as well as a relative impact of investment and the expensive cost of recovery in the built environment. And as business owners, it is counterintuitive to put our resources into a project without ensuring that this project will generate a return. And a project such as a building will not likely yield any substantial return if it gets compromised by the host of natural hazards that frequent our country. To developers, including the engineers and architects that make up their teams, the reputation is on the line with every project that we undertake. Even long after the project has been completed, the public and more importantly, the future clients will judge us by how well we've designed and implemented the design of the building against the hazards they are exposed to. Now, may I ask the question? Next slide, please. Can we assume that both owners and developers cannot afford to ignore hazards and risk in their plans and incorporate disaster risk reduction in their building design. Next slide, please. 
Now, in my opinion, the answer is a resounding no. We cannot assume that everyone will automatically do what is right for them and for their clients. We need to be absolutely certain. We need to be able to sleep soundly at night, knowing that our investment, our assets, and our people are safe because the buildings that house them have been designed properly against the hazards and risks they are exposed to. So what does this mean for owners and developers? Whether you are a building developer or an administrator, the compliance to the National Building Code is a minimum requirement, while innovation towards resilience goes beyond. This is where a good rating system comes in, which should have been taken as the norm with all the disasters we face in the country. I believe that resilience tool is not an expensive one compared to the benefit we can derive in the long term. Investment in resilience based on our experience in SM Prime has reaped invisible and multiple rewards, including cost efficiency. Today, I am pleased to be part of the launch of the Building Resilience Index, the BRI, a self-declaration system that offers a systematic way for owners and developers to identify and address the risk for the property the building plans and designs against the hazards and risks in their area. It is much needed in the present time to help owners protect their investments and developers and protect reputation. On the other side of the equation, Resilience Tool provides platform for financial institutions, lead lenders and insurance companies and the banks to understand the potential risk of the asset evaluate investments and making sound financial decisions. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, these are some of our investments in disaster resilient features. I believe there are still some owners and developers who feel that investing in disaster resilience is a cost, an additional unnecessary expense. They fail to realize that the cost of repairing a damaged property, not to mention the opportunity losses due to operational disruptions, far outweigh the cost of incorporating risk mitigation in, the, in their designs and plans. Next slide, please. Okay, here are some examples. We have reaped uh, benefits and rewards for us. Thanks to our leaders in SM, especially our chairman, Mr. Hansi, we have come to appreciate the value of long-term resilience planning as an investment. DRR, or disaster risk reduction, is one of our core business strategies. We put in the necessary steps to ensure that our investments are well protected. Over the years, we have seen our resilience investments pay off from our disaster resilience design features. Next slide, please. These are still some of the examples that we have, that we have done over the years and have been our core strategies from the very start. Thank you. Can we go to the next slide, please? So our transparency and communication in resilience have attracted investors and enhanced our public image. That is why we fully support the BRI initiative. I hope that the owners and developers in this forum and appreciate the need for, as well as the benefit from investing in resilience. And I hope too, that representatives from the financial sectors, the banks and insurance providers recognize the critical role in driving the success of the Building Resilience in uh, Initiative. As the fellow stakeholders of a resilient future, we owe it to ourselves, our families, our employees, our clients, and our communities to start moving in the right direction. And the Building Resilience Index Initiative to identify, manage, and disclose risk is a silver lining, without a doubt, a step in the right direction. Congratulations to IFC. Good morning, and thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Now we move on to another developer, Raymond Rufin. Good morning, uh, everyone, and good evening to all of our friends who are in the, the U.S. 
Uh, congratulations, Lisa, on a very nice presentation. Uh, I couldn't agree uh, more with a lot of the points that you mentioned. Um, also, congratulations to Angela Omid and the IFC team. I know you've worked also very hard on the BRI and what a special moment this is for all of us to finally launch uh, the BRI after so much hard work. Um, next slide, please. So today I'm going to talk about the business case for resilient buildings, but really because of limited time, focusing on some key themes. Um, if any of you would like to connect with us uh, on social media or connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, the information is on the screen. Feel, feel free to do so. Uh, we love as Neo to collaborate and engage in conversations, especially when it's about important topics like resilience, um, ESG, green buildings, and sustainability. Next slide, please. So the core message I have for everyone today is resilience builds trust. You know, a lot of people, when they think about resilience, they, they get, you know, bogged down in trying to figure out the details. So, you know, what's the motivation? Yes, I know there are disasters, but that's further down the road. Um, I think for me, when I reflect on what is the significant business case for resilience, I think it really is trust building. And in the world that we live in today, many of you see this, right? Um, it's getting harder and harder to build trust. People are losing trust in institutions, in large organizations, even in governments. So building trust for many businesses, especially real estate owners and developers becomes ever more challenging. So when I look at resilience, I see this as one of the vital and impactful ways that we can build trust. Next slide, please. And so this is a picture that most owners and developers like me love. It's, uh, you know, we look at the design of a particular building or feature. We like to look at the materials. We spend so much time and energy looking at how it will, you know, look, how it will feel, how everything comes together. But when you look beyond, you know, the marble, the stone, the stainless steel, the aluminum, all of these different things, if you look closely at this picture, you know, there's one critical piece missing. And that's the people, right? Because all of our real estate, as pretty and as beautiful and as, as nice as our real estate projects look, at the end of the day, the real estate is made possible because there are users, people who use the building, the facility, the structure that we have created, right? So I think first and foremost, resilience builds trust with the users, right? Because our users need to trust our buildings. If you build a building, develop a building, and the users, sorry, previous slide, um, and people do not trust the building, you are not going to be able to make that business successful. So for us as office building developers, we know this firsthand because many of the corporate clients who choose to locate in our buildings really, really pay attention to what are the risks that their office, their future office and their, tent and their employees will be exposed to if they move to your building. They really look at all of the details, you know, how does your building stand up in case of a disaster? How does your operations team respond? And so I think when you invest in resilience in the way you design, build and operate your building, ultimately your users will gain a higher level of trust that they can call that building home. Now, whether it's a residential building, an office building, a shopping mall, a hotel, um, bottom line, every user needs to have a certain level of trust in that building and in that owner and developer. And I think really integrating resilience is one of the best ways you can do that. And that's core, right? That's core for any business. If you can make your building more attractive to your users and customers, then there is a financial benefit and financial success that is a result of that. Next slide, please. But aside from just the users of your buildings, resilience builds trust also for your partners. So it was great we had Joanne speak earlier from BPI. So, you know, banking partners are very critical. When a bank wants to lend money on a real estate project, a lot of it is really underwriting risk. And to the extent that you can integrate resilience into your building, you're also reducing the risk of your lender partner on that building. Same applies for insurance companies. When they insure your building, they are really trying to understand what are the risks that this building has and what are the risks that is going to be damaged or lost in the event of a, a disaster or a calamity or a unforeseen event. So it's very, very important that these partners get a higher level of trust and confidence because if they do, they can provide better service, they can provide lower cost. Um, and our hope is with BRI is 
as we can develop this tool and it becomes widely adopted and accepted, and you know, I'll, 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 I'm going to follow up with Joanne at one point and joke with her, and hopefully that at some point the bank lending rates will also reflect the BIR rating, the BRI rating that buildings get. So the idea is, can a building owner who has invested in resilience to a very, very strong degree really have a cheaper cost of financing or even a cheaper cost of insurance premium? because of all of the investments and work put in to reduce the amount of risk exposure for that building. So that's the that's the big dream and we hope that we get there at one uh, future point in time. And next slide. And so I'd like to end with this, uh, this is a very short presentation, but really the core message I want to leave is resilience builds trust and confidence in a building, making it attractive to users and partners and ultimately underpins its longevity and success. You know, buildings will last you for 50, 60, 70 years. You have some buildings that have lasted for 100 years. And so when you look at these assets, when you build and develop these types of assets, you really have to think of the long game. And I think when you think of the long game, you really try to think about who are the users who are going to make your business successful? Who are the partners who will help you operate, run, and develop that particular project? And can that project last? In a country like the Philippines, and as you've heard it so many times mentioned today, the number of disasters and exposures we have is so significant. Um, can my building last? Can it last not just you know, 20, 30 years, but maybe 60, 70, 80 years? And I think resilience is one of the key areas that we can all focus on that really deliver, delivers a strong, strong business uh, contribution to owners, developers, and managers of buildings. Thank you, everyone, and I look forward to chatting with uh, Lisa in the next section. Thank you so much, Lisa and Raymond. Now, we would like to, to discuss with the developers your perspectives on Building Resilience Index and how you can use this tool um, in, in your projects. Thanks, Angela. Uh, Lisa, you want to kick off or you want me to go ahead? Well, I, I guess I okay. guess I can. Uh, yeah. yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, I'll just, I'll just kick things off. So I think, you know, when we became a pilot partner for the Building Resilience Index, um, to be admittedly, I was very, very curious to find out how will this all work? Because, you know, for an owner and developer, it has really been a struggle. If you ask us, how resilient are your buildings? It's not an easy question to answer. Most will say, Yes, I know we have resilient features. Yes, we have designed to be code compliant. Yes, we have put in efforts. But really, if you say, yes, you've done those things, but how resilient are you really? Um, there really hasn't been any framework, any tool, any way to really kind of gauge that. And so we were very, very excited to be a pilot partner for the BRI with our seven new building. And going through the process, I think, you know, it was really a light bulb moment for me. I realized that this can be such a powerful tool for the real estate industry, because for the first time, there is a way for people to know how resilient our buildings are. And if your building needs to be more resilient, you also have a roadmap on how you can make our, your building or even our buildings more resilient from where they are today. So. Um, Lisa, maybe you can also share your experience. Yeah, you know, uh, the, the very uh, moment that uh, Resilience Tools was introduced to SM came from Aris Papadopoulos, a global founder of Arise. And um, five years ago, he was already trying to convince us to uh, submit to Making Cities Resilient and some other tools of IBM, developed by IBM and the Arise Global. It was really, there were hesitations on our end at that time, because, you know, disclosing something that is, that would be known to the public, transparency, is something that we, we would want to handle carefully. So at that time, we went into our first step, and we were, I was successful to convince some of the properties of SM to be part of a, of a, of a review in resilience. And now here it is. So I'm excited to uh, be part of the BRI because after that, uh, you know, that icebreaker in the company, the, uh, the, our owners, our chief executives 
understood the value of transparency, the value of resilience in a company. It gives really, uh, it puts our reputation on the line and it has upgraded our image uh, in the public. And now uh, also I understand that just doing disaster resilient designs is already resiliency. So it's not because uh, looking at the BRI, it, it's a very holistic system that will identify, manage, and uh, manage the risk of overall. So I'm really happy to be part of this. Uh, and I, and I uh, would like to express Mr. Hans when we discuss, Mr. Hans is the chairman of, our, of SM Prime. When we discuss this, and he is really wholeheartedly accepting this process of BRI. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. You know, I just want to make a final comment. Um, you know, I really want to thank our uh, co-chair, Alex Palma and Lisa. You know, we are all together on the board of Arise. For those who are not familiar, um, you know, you can look it up on the web to find out more about the work of Arise. But, you know, one of the great uh, projects that we embraced uh, this year for Arise as we tried to really contribute to building out more resilient infrastructure in the Philippines is really to leverage the work of IFC for BRI. So thank you, Alex and Lisa, for supporting. You know, I, I brought this idea to you and yes. you fully embraced it. And now we're very excited. So on a final note, I'd like to invite um, all owners, developers, um, project proponents, um, you know, we will be doing a campaign as Arise and also with IFC and with BRI to kind of push this throughout the year. Please join us and support this campaign and let's try to get as many buildings rated for resilience as we can. Thank you. Maybe Lisa, some final words from you? Yeah, thank you too. I think uh, I'd like to pass it to uh, our co-chair, Alex Pama, for, the, for some words. Uh, Yusek Pama, our co-chair in Arise. Well, well, thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Raymond, for, for your presentations. And, and I, I guess with what you guys have said, um, it leaves me um, no more room to, to, to uh, push forward or push the envelope in so far as uh, BRI is concerned. I think um, whatever I would say regarding uh, the, the, the positive aspects of, of, of BRI would, would be uh, akin Preaching to the choir, uh, as we usually say. However, from the point of view of Arise, um, Raymond just said uh, thank you for, for, for pushing this. And, and uh, the very first time Raymond uh, introduced, introduced this to us, I or we in, in, in Arise have been looking not only within the context of what BRI can put on the table in so far as uh, resilience is concerned to our members, but even beyond our membership. We are looking at this beyond the membership of the current uh, members we have in Arise, but also e even in the aspect of um, maybe convincing the government uh, to, do, to join in the bad wagon for this, because as they say, we want to approach this thing in a whole of society, whole of a nation approach, and the partnership and, and uh, the, the consortium that we look forward to having is both on the private sector, the um, CSOs, and the government uh, for that matter. This is something, as I have said earlier in my, in, in my talk, in my opening remarks, as an idea whose time has come, and uh, it is only uh, fitting and proper for us to push the envelope forward. Now, we have, uh, we have seen what the NEO and, and, and um, uh, Super Malls or SM have been doing relative to this, and I think we are in a very good position to push and to advertise this further for the adoption of um, at the BRI in the Philippines. We needed it yesterday. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lisa, Raymond, and Yusek Alex. I just have to say it is such a powerful endorsement, uh, the message that you, you just shared to us, especially when sharing something about uh, a novel tool like Building Resilience Index um, with innovators and early adopters like you. We, we have confidence that we can scale this up in the Philippines. So thank you so much. Thank you. Moving forward, following the developer dialogue is a panel discussion composed of technical experts who played a central role in the development of Building Resilience Index. Our first expert is Aris Papadopoulos, founding chair of Resilience Action Fund, a nonprofit advancing resilience in the built environment. He authored the book Resilience, the Ultimate Sustainability, which inspired the documentary Built to Last. 
Aris has 35 years of experience in construction and energy, having served as CEO of Titan America for 20 years. For 10 years, he has served uh, the global board of the UNDRR's Arise Initiative and was its founding chair. He advocated before five UN conferences and contributed to the 2015 Sendai Framework signed by 187 nations. He has appeared in the New York Times uh, Weather Channel, NBC, and other media and provides counsel to government, industry, and organizations. Iris earned bachelor's and master's degrees in chemical engineering from MIT and an MBA from Harvard University. He is a World Trade Center 9-11 survivor. Welcome, Iris. Our second speaker is a world-class social entrepreneur, a safe housing advocate, and a bricklayer. Dr. Elizabeth Hausler is the founder and CEO of Build Change and a global expert on resilient housing, post-disaster reconstruction, and systems change. Elizabeth's strategic direction and leadership have grown Build Change from a few employees in 2004 to a global team spread across five continents. She has profoundly influenced global development policy by making resilience a major consideration for reconstruction efforts. Elizabeth's extensive experience in post-disaster communities, including a Fulbright scholarship in India, led her to found Build Change. She is the recipient of many honors and in 2011 was named the U.S. Social Entrepreneur of the Year by the Schwab Foundation. Elizabeth is also an Ashoka Fellow, a Draper Richards Kaplan Fellow, and an Echoing Green Fellow. She holds a PhD from UC Berkeley in civil engineering as well as a master's degree from the University of Colorado and a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Illinois. Welcome, Elizabeth. Our third speaker is the global CEO of Miyamoto International. Dr. H. Kit Miyamoto is a world-leading expert in disaster resilience, response, and reconstruction. He provides engineering and policy consultation to the World Bank, USAID, UN agencies, and governments. He is a California Seismic Safety Commissioner and a structural engineer. From the 2010 Haiti earthquake to the Ecuador, Nepal, Indonesia, New Zealand, and Mexico earthquakes, Dr. Miyamoto has led teams on dozens of response and reconstruction projects around the world. He also led seismic risk reduction programs in Turkey, the Philippines, Romania, and Bangladesh, as well as risk mitigation policy work in Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, and El Salvador. Dr. Miyamoto holds advanced degrees from the Tokyo Institute of Technology and California State University, where he has been recognized as a distinguished alumnus. Major media such as ABC, CNN, LA Times, New York Times, and Rolling Stone have profiled him. He was also featured in the Designing for Disaster exhibit at the National Building Museum. And to moderate the discussion by our technical expert panel, I would also like to call back to the virtual stage, Mr. Omid Saberi, Senior Industry Specialist at IFC and Global Lead for the BRI program. Omid. Thank you so much, uh, Angelo, and thank you uh, to our dear panelists. Uh, I, I would like to recognize the contribution of our panelists in the technical review panel. We also had uh, FM Global um, that he um, do. He wouldn't be able to join tonight to, to our discussion, but thank you for our panelists. I know that Aris is joining from Greece, which is very early in the morning. Thank you, Aris, for joining at this time of the uh, day for you. Uh, so I, will, I would like to start with you, Elizabeth. And, I think we heard from different um, you know, members of this webinar around transparency and wanted to hear, uh, given your experience in build change, what do you feel about transparency and how this can help the value chain um, in, in building sector? Thanks, Omid. And again, Congratulations on this huge milestone and this incredible accomplishment to you as well as the team. And thanks very much to the supporters. It's uh, been a pleasure to be a part of the technical expert panel. And I think that there's, you know, there's so much more to come in terms of applying uh, the BRI to multiple commercial buildings as well as housing. Um, look, transparency is an important thing because, you know, transparency is is, is power and knowledge and it enables us to all take the actions that are necessary to increase the resilience of um, of various buildings, whether they be commercial buildings, housing, or otherwise. So the more we, we know, the more informed we are um, to um, take action. I was super inspired by all of the panelists today 
but the comments of Ms. Solerio and Mr. Rafino, especially with, with transparency and um, accountability coming from the private sector, it's really inspiring. I love the message about resilience uh, building trust. So I think um, that the BRI is a great tool for, uh, for doing that. Um, fantastic, thank you. Um, and I agree, you know, building trust is, is critical, um, you know, given the, the situation that we are, you know, more and more having transparency brings power to the private sector. But a kid, well, I want to come to you and, and ask you around, you know, when we say codes, um, codes save lives, but they don't save buildings. And, and what does this mean in the context of PRI, if you can give us some examples from your experience? Yeah, most definitely. Um, so there's the, uh, this, uh, global myth, you know, if you build per code, if it means the code, essentially is so-called earthquake proof or hurricane proof. That's a complete myth. If you meet the minimum code, essentially, uh, will try to save lives. That's the, the whole thing's about. Like it's a true in every country from California to Japan, to Philippines, to you just name it. Okay. For example, New Zealand, uh, 2011. Christchurch, they had an earthquake about minus six point three or so. Okay, and out of four hundred thousand people living there, they lost about one hundred eighty people, which is less than point zero zero. I think it's some point zero one percent of our total population, right? So fatality rate is very small. So therefore, it's actually met the intended building code. But guess what? Out of about two thousand building stocks they had, it's a modern concrete, you know, buildings they have. Yeah. They lost almost 90% of it. Lost means didn't collapse, just only a couple of buildings actually collapsed completely. Just tilted a little bit, you know, cracked some concrete. And once that happens, it's very difficult to repair, actually. So yes, they the code was able to save lives, but was not able to save a building or functional building, or this particular case is a whole city, the whole Christchurch. It was shut down for almost 18 months after the event. You know, till this day, if you go there, still half of buildings has not re, you know built back yet. You know, it's, they're getting in the right direction. They'll they'll get there. They got the best engineers in the whole world, as far as I can see it. But even them, even the New Zealand building code, it cannot save their whole buildings like that. But there are different ways to do it. This BRI is a wonderful way to do that. Thanks so much. That's a very very good point. That codes save people, but not the buildings. And and if we want to go and save the, the state, we need to go beyond the code. And that's where BRI can, can bring the value. And Aris, good morning to you. One, one question to you that would be interesting for our listeners to understand is that what these five levels mean, right? And, and how would you then, you know, differentiate between building X and Y because of these levels? And maybe if you can shed some light on this, Aris. Yes, uh, good, good morning to the Philippines, good evening to the US, and uh, I don't want to say good night in Greece, but it's probably it is. Uh, it's such an honor to be on this uh, on this webinar, um, and uh, it's such a pleasure to work uh, closely with uh, colleagues and, and associates uh, from Arise uh, in the Philippines, who I've known for, for many years. And thank you, uh, uh, IFC, for the, the great work and the great collaboration. Uh, this is a major milestone. Uh, and a dream also for, for myself. Uh, as you presented very well, uh, Omid, uh, the BRI has five rating levels, A plus, A, B, C, and the lowest is R. And each level corresponds to the building having certain resilience mitigation measures for each of the hazards that apply to that location. And each of these measures reduce the building's physical vulnerability to a hazard. In other words, lead to better physical integrity, as BRI uh, calls it. So we created this global uh, technical expert panel to discuss and agree on what mitigation measures should be required for each level and includes members of the uh, present uh, here in this webinar, uh, plus uh, uh, other members who unfortunately could not join. Uh, these discussions went on for almost six months and uh, some occasional intense debates uh, uh, did occur as you would expect from experts. <laughs> so what we have arrived is, is the following. If you want to be an A or A plus, uh, it means that um, you need to be at the level of what we consider to be current global best practice resilient measures. And uh, as Kit mentioned, 
these will typically be above the local codes of the particular location because we've picked the best from all over the world uh, of things that buildings are doing. Some, some of it is not even in, in codes uh, yet uh, all over the world uh, to make their buildings uh, uh, more resilient. Uh, and as uh, Kit mentioned, life safety standards are really what dictate most codes, not saving the building standards. So if you want to be an A or A plus, uh, these are, this is kind of the, the high bar that, that we've set. Um, however, we're also asking that all buildings do meet the local codes that were in force at the time the uh, building was built. Uh, if they don't, then they will uh, be at the lowest level and our level. So code is a prerequisite. Uh, but it's not a guarantee uh, for any of the uh, rating levels above R. Uh, the difference between A and A plus, as you mentioned, is the operational continuity measures that includes backup power, water access, uh, and general access to the facility itself. So what uh, makes a B or C rating? Uh, B would be a strong local code, which incorporates many recommended good mitigation practices. And I've seen in the Philippines that, uh, particularly with wind, uh, the codes in the Philippines are, have become very strong. The, the latest uh, structural code, uh, I would say, is pretty cl close to, to world class. Uh, the other location that um, my home in Miami uh, has also, I would say, world class wind standards. Uh, however, the water standards uh, may not be yet at those world class levels. So B is a strong local code. Uh, C would be a moderate or maybe outdated local code. Uh, which may incorporate some, but not all the recommended practices. And finally, R means that a building was either not built to code, or if it was built to code, does not meet even the minimum requirements for a C uh, level. Uh, so that uh, kind of wraps uh, th that question, uh, hopefully, uh, Omid, for our audience. Sure. Thank you, Aris. This, this, is, this is very good. Um, I'm going back to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, one of the challenges that we had on building resilience was around certifying buildings, right? Uh, on green buildings, we can certify a building as green, uh, green certified building. But on resilience, we want to... Can you please mute if you are not speaking, I'm hearing feedback. Um, on, on green buildings we can certify a building but on resilience we cannot certify a building because the liability needs to stay with the with the project team can you shed some light on this on on why and what are the other alternative solutions that we can work for building resilience instead of certi certifying buildings yeah, it's a great point and a great question. It's not because the BRI is not at the moment a, a third party certification. It's a voluntary self rating implemented by the builders, the building owners or uh, the developers representative. So, you know, and that person should be a qualified licensed professional. It should be repeated regularly. Um, it should be done by someone who's got training in assessing buildings and that sort of thing. It should be repeated regularly, like I said, at least every 10 years. And definitely after any major renovation, but at the moment it's it's voluntary and the responsibility is with the building owner. But I think it, several of the speakers touched on this, especially Her Excellency Saskia DeLong. She articulated this very well. We have to create incentives for resilient building and that will open opportunities for other users to use the tool banks financial institutions and others who have something at stake here, something to lose if the building is not as resilient as it could be. So even though it's it's a voluntary tool now, I can see the opportunity um, for it to be used by various different parties, insurance companies, co even corporate philanthropists, that sort of thing. Any, any person in a funding position can create the demand for the use of this index. And that will, of course, then create even more momentum around more people being trained in how to use it and, and being capable to use it. I think, you know, several of the speakers today have talked about how the tool can bring stakeholders together because, you know, the built environment is a multi-stakeholder, multi, um, it's, a, it's a, an environment with a lot of compl complexity and there are a lot of players involved here. And so it's a tool that can bring people together around something that's um, you know consistent and objective and uh, actionable so it's an exciting an exciting moment to be at um 
I think, though, there's another opportunity that we haven't talked about yet today, um, which is something that I just want to add in there. The possibility of extending the tool or using a similar tool to uh, buildings built informally, so informal housing. Build Change works mostly on these types of buildings in the Philippines and elsewhere, making those buildings uh, disaster resilient in various different ways. And what strikes me looking at the five levels is that the largest reduction in probable maximum maximum loss could actually be achieved by taking housing from R to C or B. And so we can see this huge opportunity, not only at the high end, um, taking commercial buildings from A to A plus to maintain operation um, operability after a disaster, but we can see a huge advantage to going from R to C or B in informal housing with the tool as well to reduce the potential for losses and to make it so those buildings could actually be repaired and salvaged after the next disaster. That's extremely good point in terms of, you know, what is the value of from R to B or C? That's absolutely true. And, and informal housing actually is one of the largest portion of the, the housing sector in Philippines and, and the experience of build change in you know, implementing microfinance in that, that sector is, is very good. And as IFC and other banks, we would be you know, willing and looking for opportunities there to, to be able to engage in that level um, in, in informal housing as well. Going back to you, Kate, uh, one question for you is, you know, what is the cost of resilience, all right? Would it cost us double to go and be a, a resilient building? How much would it cost? That's normally the first question everyone asks. Yeah. Well, second biggest myth is the, the providing a higher resiliency is too expensive. It's not affordable. That is so untrue, you know? And uh, if you see the, uh, to become from a, or B is essentially called minimum, right? So you got to be in a B, obviously, and that's minimum given. But to become A, it's really subtle things, little things, little tiny things that makes a huge difference in how actually buildings performs in a disaster area, you know? Such as, for example, the uh, um, seismic. You know, there's the piers, right? The column, and there's a rebar inside, steel inside, and there's a hoop, right? If those little hoops we go tie, is how it's hooked in. Is that like hoop like this or hook like this? That's what makes a huge difference. That's from a, essentially from you know R to A all the way. You know, it just it makes a big difference. Like little things like that. Uh, in a Kathmandu, uh, there's a Tony Story Hilton projects. It's been engineered. Uh, we assist the engineer on that thing. They actually put these energy dissipators into that system. It's a new construction, and essentially reduced it the seismic vibration by a factor of two. So it's a much much higher resiliency, and the cost increment of that was less than 1% of a total construction cost. You see, because essentially most of the things you have to do to make the higher resiliency is like a structural stuff, you know? You know what I mean? And that cost of a structural cost is usually about 10 to 20% of a total building cost. Depends on what kind of building it is, but something like that, usually for the larger commercial structures, you know? So if you try to improve that a little 20% or 10% of it, you know, it, you don't affect the huge construction cost at all whatsoever. That's actually key right there. And also that some cases we know that using the, this high-tech devices and stuff like that to improve the uh, uh, resiliency, sometimes you can actually reduce the construction materials, like amount of steels and concrete. So actually you can see some certain cases net positive as far as cost is concerned. So that's it. That's great to, to know that the, the cost of resilience is not massive, and despite the fact that some people may have this yeah, in their head that this, this is going to be very expensive. Exactly. And also one thing that I want to point out, one of the biggest difference between B to A is actually the, the independent uh, site inspection. That's it. That's a very small amount of cost. You know, but that kind of uh, implementation of what's going to happen in the construction site makes a huge difference. You know, so such a small cost just make it just so impactful. Excellent. Thanks so much. And Alice, I, I come back to you. Uh, obviously, uh, resilience is partly your brainchild of 
of the work that you have done with Arise as well. And in, in doing this work, you know, when we have these mitigation measures uh, for different hazards, how do you how do you see these mitigation measures play an important role? And whether these are the fixed elements or are, are these these elements going to improve as we go? Yeah, th th thank you, because I, I know that's a key question uh, that uh, a lot of our audience uh, asks and, and the users will be asking. Uh, and as you mentioned uh, in your presentation, Omar, the first step is to establish what the local hazards are. And uh, the, the BRI, as you mentioned, contains four hazard categories, wind, water, fire, and geoseismic. Within those four categories, there are 14 types of hazards. Uh, so there's a, a complete list of the different types of hazards. And for the Philippines, we've kind of uh, uh, suggested that they use a tool called Hazard Hunter that's available uh, for the Philippines to determine those hazards. Uh, of course, some of those hazards are common to all locations, uh, even outside the Philippines, like uh, urban fires and urban flooding. Uh, some of the hazards are uh, countrywide, like earthquakes and typhoons, but many of them are localized, such as tsunamis on the coast, landslides, uh, if you're in a sloped area, storm surge, flash flooding. But once you determine, once a building determines these hazards, the next step is to go through the mitigation measures worksheet that's contained in the BRI, and which shows which measures correspond to which hazards. So again, these measures are organized around the four major hazard categories, wind, water, fire, and geoseismic. Uh, just as an example, in the wind category, we have 12 mitigation measures. Uh, and since, since Philippines has typhoon hazard, uh, all 12 will apply. So uh, the measures are hazard specific. Uh, as Kit mentioned, there are uh, there there are a couple measures uh, that apply to the the uh, engineering side, uh, for example, and are common to all of the hazards. Uh, for example, uh, uh, measures 11 and 12 in the wind category. Uh, 11 says that we need to have uh, the construction uh, observed by code responsible the code responsible design engineer, uh, and also submitted and approved by the local approving authorities. Uh, but, uh, and, and that's required even for a B, uh, let's say, rating. But for an A rating, uh, as Kit mentioned, we need to go a step further. Uh, we want to have, in addition to those uh, uh, individuals, an independent uh, engineer uh, who will observe the construction. Because construction quality is so important to achieving the building's resilience that we wanted to have another set of eyes to qualify for A or A plus uh, rating. So uh, I think Elizabeth uh, mentioned the self-declaration of the building is the way we will rely on this information. Uh, and we will be asking uh, through BRI for signed statements from those code responsible engineers or representatives that the measures that they have checked off are uh, to the best of their ability and knowledge, the ones that the building actually has, uh, or if it's being designed that is being designed for. Uh, BRI was all, will also make it possible to do cost benefit analysis on what additional measures could take it to a higher level. So, as Kit mentioned, you may be a B, but there may be some things that really are cost benefit wise very uh, beneficial for you to go to an A level. So, you'll be able to, to find that out. And uh, as we said uh, earlier, this uh, is a moving target because today's above code requirements could be tomorrow's code. So uh, we've suggested that every 10 years that the rating be renewed. And of course, if there's a major change in the building, a major renovation, or even a major hazard event uh, that affects the building, that we have a renewal of the rating. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Angelo, it's time for some questions and answers. I, I have seen that there has been some questions. One of the questions that was asked was, uh, you know, what is the cost of certification for resilience? Uh, the, at this point, the resilience will be a self declaration with the engineers. Um, I'm sorry if, if everyone can mute. Yes, uh, it's a, it's a self declaration by engineers and co responsible engineers. So it would be a local cost for, for the team to declare those conditions, there would be no certification costs, external certification costs. And there has been some questions in terms of, you know, the access for public, we are going to release, we have an online version of 
resilience right now, but it's a very basic system. We are working with the team now to release the first uh, version in October this year, and in October 2021, we would have the first um, version of the building resilience index that is much more sophisticated released on, online based on the user guide. We also have the user guide prepared. There was a question about user guide. We will send the user guide to all the participants in this call and after the call with, with other documents of this webinar. So everyone have access to, to the documents we have. There was a question about crowdsourcing. There's a view on in future for us to build in elements like AI and machine learning to understand the resilience condition and hazard condition and predict the future. But that's a, a big step for us. First step is to build a foundation, but the foundation will be built with the view of the future technology to be implemented in the system and help the users to go through the system much more efficiently and, and easily. With this, we hand it, thank you so much. Uh, you know, every one of you, um, I'm very, very delighted to, to have you and honored to have you in, in this session. Um, back to you, Angelo, for the closing remarks. Thank you so much, Amit, and our technical experts. It was such an interesting discussion, and I wish we had more time. But um, to let our audience know, we will be scheduling separate uh, webinars to expand on these discussions. So please uh, watch out for, for some announcements from our, uh, from our end. Now to deliver a closing message for the program, I would like to introduce Mr. John Mark Arbogast, Country Manager for the Philippines of the International Finance Corporation. John Mark, a French national, was formerly the advisor to the Vice President of Corporate Strategy and Resources, where he helped formulate and articulate strategic priorities while aligning resources to deliver on IFC's ambitious agenda. Prior to that, John Mark was a senior investment officer in the Global Water Team, where he led origination and execution of transactions in this sector globally in close coordination with regional infrastructure colleagues. In his current role as country manager for the Philippines, John Mark is responsible for all IFC activities in the country, including leading efforts to build its portfolio, developing new upstream opportunities, and enhancing its impact. He holds an MBA from Yale and a master's in aeronautical engineering from ENSICA, a French engineering school. Now, because of COVID restrictions on travel to the Philippines, John Mark is leading the country office from France, and he graciously shared with us this video recording to show his support for um, the Building Resilience Index program. So give me just one moment uh, while I share this video. Greetings to everyone. And uh, first of all, thanks uh, for being here. And thank you for conducting such an insightful session today. Uh, and I'm really glad to be surrounded by presenters from banks, global experts, developers to talk about building resilience in the Philippines. I think all of you present here today understand why resilience is so important. And uh, the Philippines is one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change and is very high on the list of countries most affected by extreme weather, disaster events or disaster risk. So I'm particularly pleased to be here today because as the country head for IFC, overseeing all of our activities and you know, among the various parts of my portfolio, resilience uh, does play one of the most important role. Um, and as you know, within the World Bank Group, IFC uh, focuses on the private sector. And our strategy in the country is built around three pillars and uh, enhancing Philippines disaster res uh, resilience capacity is actually one of them. Uh, and by the way, this is also true for our World Bank colleagues who focus on the public side uh, of things and building resilience is also a key focus for them. So while the country is deeply uh, affected by the pandemic, there is an opportunity for what we call a green, resilient, and inclusive uh, recovery. So as you can see, resilience is the key topic for us uh, these days, uh, but not only for us. So investors are also uh, moving uh, more and more by placing their money in companies that do implement green and resilient projects. So uh, the, the Building Resilience Index is being piloted in the Philippines, and it will play an important role in the achievement of uh, IFC's strategic priorities in the country in fighting against uh, climate change and, of course, in helping 
uh, towards uh, economic recovery from, from the pandemic. And as always uh, in a fight, the first step is always to have good data and a good understanding of the situation. And the building a resilient index will provide uh, such data, so mapping and resilience assessment framework that does evaluate location specific climate related risks for real estate projects and portfolio. And it's also going to facilitate uh, the identification, management, and disclosure of disaster risk in buildings, which is uh, all very important. Uh, we are piloting the tool in the Philippines with um, 10 projects. And for this pilot, I really want to emphasize that, but for this pilot to be successful, we need strong collaboration and partnerships, including from policymakers, academia, but maybe most importantly, financial institutions that will have a key role to play in, uh, in the implementation of the building uh, resilience uh, index. So again, financial institutions are extremely important. I'd like to encourage all of you to reach to our uh, IFC team working on the building resilience index. Um, for any additional resources or questions you may have. So you have uh, Angelo and Omid who are present and um, here today. So, uh, and finally, I also like to, on behalf of IFC, to express my appreciation to the Building Resilience Index donors, um, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, represented in the event by Her Excellency Saskia De Lang, ambassador of, uh, of the Netherlands to the Philippines, and the Australian government, represented in the event by James Yeomans, acting deputy head of mission for, uh, of the Australian embassy in the Philippines. Our appreciation also goes to our valued B, uh, Building Resilience Index partner in the Philippines, ARISE, the Private Sector Alliance for Disaster Resilient Societies, which is uh, today represented by uh, Vice Admiral Alexander Pama, co-chair of ARISE Philippines. And finally, uh, on behalf of IFC, again, I'd like to express my appreciation to all the participants for taking the time out of uh, your extremely busy schedule to attend the IFC's Building Resilience Index webinar. Thank you uh, for your attention and have a great day. We'll continue to be in touch and um, thank you so much. Have a great morning, everyone, and great evening. We will share the slides if there's any questions anything that we can help any partnership please re reach out to us and we'll continue to work together on this path thank you so much and, and have a great day thank you angelo thank you Omid. thank you everyone thank you